Okay, so um, hello everybody. My name is Charlie. I work on the uh, OPA team and the DevRel team at Styra. Uh, and this is Rita. Hey, everyone. Mic check, okay. Uh, I'm Rita. I am a uh, OPA gatekeeper maintainer. I work at Microsoft. And how it's going to work is I'm going to give a quick overview of OPA and policy as code. Uh, I'm going to go through um, some updates around OPA 1.0, and then Rita's going to give a quick update uh, about some changes, recent changes in the OPA Gatekeeper project as well. So I wanted to start out by asking or getting people to think about what is policy. When I think about policy, uh, policy is a way of defining allowed operations and controls uh, in system behaviors. So common policies that those of us here today will be working with uh, things like authorizing users based on organizational security requirements, uh, controlling which teams are deploying what into Kubernetes, uh, implementing API access controls, data filtering, CI CD permissions. These are all things that uh, I think of as policy. Uh, anywhere that you're implementing behavior, which is, uh, boils down to something that looks like rules, uh, that's what policy is. This is an example policy here. So uh, we have a policy here which is defining around uh, permissions around deployments to production uh, in an edge case where there's an, perhaps an, an incident and we have an on-call uh, member of the on-call support team. and They have permissions that are different based on the time of day, based on whether they're in the team uh, and the environment that they're deploying to. Uh, so this is a policy which is easily expressed in, in English, in natural language. And um, we're interested in codifying these policies. So what's policy as code? So rather than talking about policies and, uh, you know, it could be that that person who's on call needed to phone someone else and ask whether they could have extra permissions at the weekend to fix something in production, or we could have codified that policy so that uh, that, that permission could have been granted in an automated way. And so here's an example of what that policy might look like as code. As you can see, by default, we deny the request to deploy to production. But if it's the weekend and support is in the user's roles and the support's user is in the list of on-call users, then this request would actually be allowed. And when we write policy as code like this, uh, it allows us to, to automate these policy checks. And the idea is that when you start thinking about your functionality, uh, all of the policy use cases that you have, when you start thinking about them as code like uh, and codifying them in this way, you can offload that the policy as code to OPA. And I'll dig more into that in a moment. But the benefit of doing this is that uh, developers are able to focus on uh, delivering business value in their applications rather than uh, implementing the same sets of policy rules in different applications, different languages, different places in the platform. And you get all of the other benefits that you get from working on things as code. Many people here will be using Kubernetes or Terraform, other infrastructure as code tools. Uh, so you get the same, the same benefits for your policy as code stack. Uh, you get versioned, um, versions of your policy, uh, you can roll them, roll them back if they're not working as expected. Uh, you, you get code sharing benefits. You can share organizational policies and extend them um, beyond, on the, beyond the organizational defaults. And in the same way that you're familiar with collaborating on code projects, um, you, can, you can use the same kinds of tools for policy as code to allow you to write automated tests and statically analyze that policy as code. So what's Open Policy Agent? Open Policy Agent is the building blocks of a policy as code platform. But just a, a little overview about the project to begin with. Um, it's an open source general purpose policy engine. It's a graduated CNCF project, and it's a tool set for building policy as code across the stack. The core um, use case, the core way to use OPA is to help you decouple policy decision making uh, and the policy lifecycle management, updating your policies and the auditing of it, auditing of the decisions that have been made uh, to abstract that and decouple that from uh, the policy enforcement points like your applications or the tools that you're using uh, in order to have a standardized way to do policy evaluation. So. The constituent parts of OPA are a domain-specific policy language. Uh, you saw a small snippet of that earlier, and here's another one. 
um, a policy server, and which is a policy engine, which is responsible for policy evaluation, reloading of policy, and sending of decision logs, audit data about the decisions that have been made. And you bring that together and you get OPA. And so OPA works a little bit like this. You, you have a request which comes into some service. Uh, this is your policy enforcement point. Uh, and then it consults with OPA. OPA is a policy decision point. And you send JSON to OPA, a JSON request to OPA saying, this is what's happening in my system at the moment. Should this be allowed, denied, or are there any violations that I should send back to the caller? Uh, and OPA does the policy evaluation based on the currently loaded policy and the currently loaded data and responds back to the calling service, the policy enforcement point. And so this policy enforcement point could be Kubernetes API server, it could be one of your applications, it could be a CI CD job, um, it, it could be any number of different places where you want to integrate with OPA and build policy functionality. Uh, you can check out the ecosystem page on the OPA website as well uh, for existing integrations we have with, with other tools. So here's an example of, um, of some input uh, being supplied to a policy and the decision result. So in this example, we have a request from a user. Um, the, the user has been made by Peter, who is a developer, and they are trying to make a put request to a different user, Anders. And this policy is only going to allow put operations when the path matches the user's own name. So in this case, uh, the decision from OPA would be to deny the request, where allow is false. Let's take a moment to think about, um, or to, to cover what's going on inside OPA. While we're, um, so far we've been talking about how we work with OPA from the outside, from our applications or um, our policy enforcement points. Um, but let's see what's going on inside OPA as well. So, OPA is when a decision is made, when a request comes in from a policy enforcement point, OPA will log those decisions to a decision log store if configured. And what's great about this is it allows you to, for any, um, any re um, decision which is made within an open policy agent instance, um, you can know the policy version at that time, uh, the input that was provided, and the policy which was evaluated, and you can see the result. And what this gives you is an audit log of all of the decisions that were made, and it, it provides them in a way which can be replayed or replicated after the fact, should you need to debug why a policy decision was different from what you expected or what you intended. At the same time as all of this is going on, OPA is reloading policy bundles and data bundles from any endpoints that you specified um, in order to make sure that OPA has the latest policy and the latest data needed to make effective policy decisions. So what's great about this is that you can run OPA in many different places. Um, often people run OPA as a sidecar, for example, next to API um, instances where o OPA is being used for API authorization, as an example. Uh, and OPAs, those OPAs are rolled out as sidecars as part of the application's deployment. But policy and data updates can be supplied to OPA without redeploying the application. So all of that, uh, we call it the bundle service API, is running as well, running as well in the background. So the OPA community uh, is, is a vibrant community of users and contributors from different organizations. We have many integrations. Um, do, do, do check them out. The chances are there are, are existing integrations for the tools that you're using. Um, and uh, check out the ecosystem page on the website uh, too. Just to summarize the OPA project, um, I wanted to highlight this great example from a, a talk at the uh, co-located event at the previous KubeCon in Paris. Um, this is a, a presentation from Bloomberg. They've got an um, AI platform where they're using OPA for permissions. Uh, so the OPA provides us a generic way to apply policy consistently across all our services and systems. I think this is obviously a fantastic quote, and I've included it in the presentation for that reason. But uh, I think it uh, embodies the way that we imagine OPA being used. Uh, we, we hope that OPA can be a decision point for many different applications in a whole platform. Uh, and so when, I, when you're thinking about using OPA, think about not just one application and one use case, think about many and the value that you could have from standardizing, uh, standardizing on that as a technology. So the exciting update um, or the, the, the new news about 
uh, OPA, the OPA project, is that we're targeting to release OPA 1.0 on the 2nd of December. That's the current target date for this release. Um, this is a, obviously a milestone release for the project uh, and will consolidate OPA's functionality for years to come. Uh, super exciting and um, it will allow us to, to move forward and do new things with the project. OPA 1.0 will still have a backwards compatibility mode, um, but this will be uh, an, an opt-in for, for users of OPA when it's running as a server. Um, if you're interested in this in particular, um, I would encourage you to come and chat to me at the OPA kiosk tomorrow. Uh, I'll go into a little bit of detail about it just now, though. For most users, we're encouraging, uh, we're encouraging most users of OPA and authors of Rego policy to update their Rego to be uh, to use the new Rego syntax. This syntax is uh, more readable and designed to, to make it easier to, to use OPA. And we encourage you to update your policies if they're policies that uh, you yourselves are, are working on and, and have control over. The V0 compatible mode and compatible flag, uh, we're encouraging users to only use this if, they absolute, if absolutely necessary. Um, this will allow you to run V0 version Rego in a post 1.0 version of OPA. And this is uh, recommended only for people who are using OPA with code which is supplied potentially from external third party customers uh, or, or users who they, where they don't have control over the code that's being supplied. Um, Obviously, uh, please do come and chat to me if you're in this position. Uh, it doesn't apply to most users, but um, it is an important use case, and it's, uh, the current focus between now and the release uh, is, is on making sure this functionality is, uh, is working just perfectly. What are the main updates in OPA 1.0? So I mentioned about a new syntax. This new syntax centers around these, uh, these new keywords. You've seen some of them in the examples I've shown already, um, where we write things like allow if, or a, a rule which is a set uh, contains. So these if and contain keywords in particular, uh, you'll start to see if you're, if you're not, haven't been looking at uh, modern Rego for already. Uh, these are uh, the two most obvious um, new keywords. Uh, these will become the new default syntax, as I explained, but other important updates are that deprecated built-in functions will no longer work, and many of the strict mode checks, which you can currently um, check for with the check command, um, will become uh, required by default. I'll go into those in just a moment. Uh, here's another example showing, uh, uh, showing how, how a policy can be rewritten uh, using some of the new keywords. Um, and, and you can uh, you can scan this QR code if you're interested in reading in a little bit. Uh, we've got a, a page on the OPA documentation which explains in detail all of the changes coming in OPA 1.0. Um, the rest of uh, my section of the presentation, I'm going to go through the recommended set of steps to upgrade older Rego to um, Rego v1. So the first thing we recommend people do is that they run OPA check. This will find any pass errors or raise any compilation errors that may be present in particularly old Rego. Uh, you can check out this uh, list of OPA errors, which will guide you on dealing with or fixing any particular errors that you may encounter when running this step. Uh, and this is your first port of call when uh, upgrading a Rego code base for OPA 1.0. The next step would be to run OPA check with the strict flag. As I mentioned, many of the strict um, check recommendations will become required in OPA 1.0, and this is uh, a good way for you to do that prior to, um, prior to upgrading. Uh, as I mentioned, duplicate imports, unused local assignments uh, are no longer going to be allowed, and also use of deprecated functions uh, will be all flagged, uh, flagged by this check. One thing to note when running OPA check strict is that um, when you fix the recommendations from OPA check strict, you'll need to run OPA check strict again uh, in order to allow OPA check strict to continue and make, the, uh, make checks on other files or uh, later in the file because it exits early. So make sure you keep running it until you don't get any errors. This is the, if you're working with a particularly old Rego code base, this is the, um, if you, once you've got past this stage, that's, uh, you've done the, the bulk of the work. 
the, next, the next steps are um, either automated or uh, something that you can do piece by piece. So OPA format, write Rego v1. Uh, that allows you to take a pre uh, a v0 Rego file and upgrade it automatically using the OPA format command. Uh, so this is showing a before and after example uh, of what a, a, a v0 file looks like before and, and then after uh, using OPA format, write Rego v1. Using the write flag, uh, we'll write uh, formatting updates to disk. Uh, so if you want to up update files in place, you can do that. If you're interested in previewing the results of, um, of, of what this would do, you don't, just don't specify the write flag. Uh, you pass arguments uh, to, to specify which files or directories you're interested in using this with. Um, so yeah, have a play around of it beforehand. Uh, there we go. So the final step that we recommend people run is to use the regal linter. This is not built into OPA, but is a binary that you download separately. Uh, something that I've been working a lot on in the last year with my colleague Anders. Um, what's, uh, a lot of people have uh, you know, potentially uh, adversarial relationships with different linters that they've maybe used in the past for other languages. Uh, our hope is that you won't have such a relationship with Regal. Regal is intended to be a learning tool. It's intended to help you write good policy code. It's intended to make sure your policies are as good as they can be. If you're finding one of the rules frustrating, uh, we would love to hear that feedback. Um, but this is uh, the final step that we recommend that you take when uh, performing an upgrade uh, to, to OP, uh, uh, Rego v1. And what this will help you do crucially is while there are many uh, best practices encoded in the linter rules as well, uh, many of uh, bugs and um, misconceptions that uh, people write in Rego can actually be identified in an automated way in Regal. And I think if you're interested in opting in partially to some of that functionality, uh, you can just run with the bugs section of the rules for starters. Uh, that's, I think, the most important, um, most important section of rules to run in order to make sure your policy is actually doing what you expect it to. Uh, this is particularly important if you don't have tests, which of course you should uh, for your policy. Uh, that's, of course, one of the main benefits of policy as code is that you're able to do automated tests on it. Uh, so anyway, make sure you run Regal Lint as well. There are lots of uh, other benefits that you gain from, from doing so. The other thing I would just briefly highlight is that uh, we have a language server uh, built into Regal as well. Uh, this is useful and easy to run from various editors. We have uh, first class support for VS Code, uh, increasingly good support for NeoVim, um, and we're, we're working on the JetBrains suite uh, at the moment. So yeah, do, do try that out. We have uh, like live evaluation and debugging functionality built in based on the language server protocol, language server protocol and the debug adapter protocol from Microsoft. Um, so uh, they've been really helpful and productive for building out a great Rego, uh, great Rego developer experience. And so yeah, I would, I would really encourage you to, to try that out too. So if you're going through this process and you find that you get stuck, um, you wouldn't be the first one. And uh, we do a lot of support in the OPA Slack. We have our own Slack. It's not the CNCF Slack. Uh, that's the QR code that's on the screen just now. Um, we're just going to talk shortly about Gatekeeper. There's a separate channel for the Gatekeeper related queries. But uh, feel free to post in. If you're not sure, feel free to post in the general help channel. And um, myself and, and others associated with the project spend a lot of time there and uh, are always interested to help with trying to make sure your Rego is as good as it can be. If you're not a Slack person or your company doesn't allow access to Slack, hopefully they allow access to GitHub. We have GitHub discussions as well for Open Policy Agent. Similarly, there is a gatekeeper section on there. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we do spend time looking at those and responding there as well. Uh, if you find an issue or a bug, um, it, it does happen, um, so please be ready to file issues. Uh, we lo always love to see a well-written issue that's easy to replicate and containing all the information we need to fix the issue. So uh, please do that too. Uh, the, the QR code at the bottom left, that's a link to a blog which my colleague wrote, which outlines the process that I've described around upgrading an old Rego code base in more detail. Um, you're encouraged to read that as well. 
So I'm now going to hand over to Rita, who's going to give a few updates about what's been going on in the Gatekeeper project. Um, and then we'll have some time for questions after that. Thank you. All right, uh, so uh, Gatekeeper. The Gatekeeper is the uh, OPA integration into with Kubernetes. Uh, and as Charlie mentioned, uh, within Gatekeeper, there is an open engine, and that is being used to evaluate the policies that you write as regos. Uh, and then here is the, a quick URL uh, with all the uh, docs and also points to the GitHub repo. Uh, so yeah, so it's an emission webhook that you can install in your Kubernetes uh, cluster, and you can then write your policies as code. Uh, and they start appearing on your clusters as CRDs, uh, and then the uh, emission webhook will basically start to uh, audit and block or deny or um, warn, uh, uh, evaluate the, the, your requests based on the policies that you have deployed to the cluster. And um, Gatekeeper is an open source project maintained by many companies, uh, and it is also a, offered as managed solutions on multiple clouds. Uh, so since this is also a deep dive, I apologize if you haven't used Gatekeeper at all, um, but I'm going to kind of talk about some of the new features that are coming uh, in 3.17, which was released a few months ago, and also 3.18, which we will be releasing uh, end of this month. Uh, so on top of uh, OPA, Gate, uh, OPA uh, which is the OPA engine that allows you to write uh, Rego uh, as policies, uh, we now also offer uh, another engine, which is the Cell engine. So for those of you who uh, follow Kubernetes very closely, you probably have heard uh, of validating a mission policy. Uh, and behind the scenes is basically a Cell engine. Uh, uh, it's, com it's called Common Expression Language, um, basically allows you to write uh, your policy with that particular language. Um, and the reason we added the support is to give users the ability to write in multiple languages depending on their use cases. Um, specifically for, um, say you have clusters that don't have, that, that are on later versions, uh, sorry, earlier versions of Kubernetes that doesn't have uh, the VAP feature enabled yet, um, with Gatekeeper, you can actually write those cell policies uh, and allow you to actually test them in your cluster um, uh, as the webhook is evaluating those requests. And you can also use the same policy and test it in your code uh, as part of your CI CD pipeline. Um, so yeah, so the cell support, cell engine support is actually graduated to beta and is de de enabled by default. Uh, and then also we have another feature that also allows uh, Gatekeeper to basically act as a front end um, that allows the users to write both rego policies as well as cell policies um, and actually generates VAP um, uh, Kubernetes resources on behalf of the user. So what that buys you essentially is um, think of the VAP uh, emission controller will basically could evaluate your request uh, uh, as part of the API server, right? And that actually reduces an extra hop uh, that needs to go to the, the Gatekeeper webhook. Um, but behind the scenes, uh, the, the Gatekeeper webhook is still there and it can actually catch uh, if there's a failure with the uh, VAP uh, policy, the VAP engine, the Gatekeeper webhook will act as a sort of a um, pass through or fall, uh, a second option in case the, the VAP, uh, control, uh, um, emission controller fails. Um, so with both of these uh, options, you can actually manage your policies with Gatekeeper, um, but essentially use uh, API server for your emission uh, validation. Uh, and then uh, we also introduced another feature uh, that allows users to specify for this particular policy, where do I want to apply a specific enforcement action. We got, we got this request a lot on GitHub, uh, which basically says, hey, uh, for this particular policy, I may only want to audit, but I don't want it to be part of the validation process or vice versa, right? So now you can actually uh, specify which enforcement action you want, to, uh, you want that particular policy to run on. 
Uh, and last but not least, we also added um, validating connect operations um, so then users can actually write rules uh, for against that particular operations. For example, uh, kubectl exec is an, uh, an operation that uh, uses the connect operation. Uh, so here's an example of how you can use uh, the, the new in, uh, scoped enforcement point feature. As you can see, traditionally, um, it just says like enforcement action, either it's um, deny or warn uh, that uh, applies the enforcement uh, action for that particular policy. Now you can actually say, hey, I, I actually want a scoped enforcement action and go ahead and uh, the action is deny and go ahead and make sure it's denied for both uh, VAP, uh, the, again, the, the entry web VAP, as well as Gator, which is our CLI for CI CD, where you can basically, again, run the same policy within your CI CD pipeline and when you actually deploy something on the cluster. And, and last but not least is the audit enforcement action whereby uh, the audit would basically scan the whole cluster and, uh, and identify all the violations that are actually running in the cluster. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, generating VAP is a, a feature that we are, uh, we are we introduced in 3.17. And in order to use this, um, all you have to do is add generate VAP to true in your uh, constraint template, which is where you actually write the particular policy. And in this case, as you can see, uh, they are all cell expressions. Uh, and next, uh, this is um, a nice little demo that we've created. You can uh, take a picture of the QR code and check it out. It basically kind of talks about how you can specify different enforcement actions. Uh, and coming in 318, uh, I think at the end of this month, uh, again, the cell engine is actually going GA um, in 318. Uh, and we actually added a weight uh, in, uh, for generating VAP binding resources. Uh, and also for those of you who use um, um, the, the sync feature, which allows you to have referential policies whereby you can say, hey, do I have a unique ingress in the, in the uh, ensure all my ingresses in the cluster are unique. And in order, in order to do that, you have to sync certain resources uh, into the OPA, uh, engine, right, uh, the OPA cache. So in this case, Gator, the CLI, now adds a support for you to test, does your policy actually uh, add a sync uh, label to ensure that um, certain resources are synchronized and replicated into the OPA cache? And we also have Gator Verify now um, supporting expansion template. Expansion templates, again, basically allows you to write policies that say you want to block certain deployments um, with pods that have, say, uh, containers run with elevated privilege. In the past, you would only get blocked uh, events on the pod, but with the expansion template, now the block can actually happen on the deployment resource. So again, uh, with Gator Verify, you can actually, uh, in your CI CD, it would actually tell you, hey, this deployment actually has uh, pods that are violating your policies. Uh, and we also recently added operation equal to generate, which uh, allows us to isolate um, and ensure that all the processes uh, that Gatekeeper has for generating CRDs and VAPs are actually all coming from a single pod. Uh, and, and, and this is, again, to ensure that all the resources that we generate are coming from uh, one source of truth. Uh, and last but not least, we added some status error reporting to the config resource. Uh, if you happen to use a gatekeeper config resource. Uh, and here is, uh, again, another example of how you can leverage the expansion um, template. And here, as you can see, I have a configuration that says, hey, in my, um, my test suite, my gator test suite, here's my expansion uh, resource that tells uh, gatekeeper for a particular deployment, go ahead and, uh, and validate these resources, i.e. pod. Uh, resources and validate those resources. And now with this, you can, um, your CI CD can test this. And here's a 
a demo that demonstrates how you can, uh, oh, sorry, this is actually a link to the Gatekeeper library um, that has a lot of the same policies but written with cell, uh, cell rules. And that is all for today. Thanks. Um, thank you. So yeah, like uh, we've, we've got a tiny bit of time for some questions. Um, you know, if it's OPA related, I can have a go at answering, gatekeeper related. Um, it's great to have Rita here to, to help with that as well. Um, well. If you're not asking questions, uh, please do leave feedback about the session. Uh, we get given these, um, these time to talk about OPA at each KubeCon and just keen to make sure that uh, we were delivering the right content. What, what use cases are you interested in? How deep do you want to go? Is, is the overview useful? Like, we've spoken to a lot of people at the kiosk and Opus everywhere. It's featured in lots of other talks. So yeah, just keen to make sure we're getting the level right, uh, the content right, the use cases right. So yeah, do scan the QR code for feedback um, and, uh, and make sure just to leave any, any recommendations there if you're not asking questions. Uh, the, the other QR code is just to access the slides. So yeah, any questions now? Uh, far away. Hello, thank you for the great talk. Regarding the telemetry, there are some third-party solutions available to scrape the OPA metrics and gatekeeper metrics as such, I believe. Is there any plan to make these metrics natively available and exported so we can integrate with Prometheus and other tooling? Um, I missed, I missed part of that. Is, it, is the question about um, scraping of, of metrics, uh, sort of a, a supplemental functionality in, in the metrics that Open Gatekeeper expose? Yeah, for example, if we are leveraging Gatekeeper and then we review the violation and we describe the violation, it, the, in the describe section, we can see down at the bottom the list of all the violations, but we want to make them more meaningful and actionable, right, instead of having to like yeah. do logging and scraping the logging and creating report. I, so I expose can, them as metrics. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so, so yeah, so Gatekeeper has metrics um, and I, that is one ask that we get a lot um, to ensure like the violation details are part of the metrics. Um, the reason we don't do that is actually for privacy reasons. Um, so uh, I think if your goal is to get the violation somehow, we also um, have a feature called PubSub feature where you can have a PubSub set up to subscribe to the, the violations. And obviously out of the box, you get the violations as part of the constraint status. So each constraint in this case is a policy, right? So in the policy CRDs, it, there are status and they, they will have all the violations in there. I know that's not the same as metrics, but there is a reason we didn't want to expose um, private information uh, as part of metrics. Got it, thank you. And follow up is uh, maybe we can uh, expand the library with some more examples of complicated uh, use cases. Like let's say we want to inspect the workload and want to make sure like every deployment should have a unique pod description budget. It should not be missing or overlapping or misconfigured. Like someone specifies a um, max and available in terms of percentages, Kubernetes rounds it up and that it results into no disruption available at all and all of these features. How do we um, like make some examples on the library and expand that to uh, some common use cases? And um, I have a follow-up. Right, uh, so a Gatekeeper library is a completely community-driven um, library, right? And um, for example, we have pass security policies uh, all in there. Um, so PSA, right? Uh, there's a mapped PSA for in the Gatekeeper library for all of those as both serve as examples, but also some of them are, some of them are pretty complicated. Um, so I would definitely ask that you check them out and let us know if there are specific um, use cases, maybe you're not sure how to write, we can definitely help. Um, but also in general, it's a very um, community driven and a lot of times when people needed something, they just go ahead and actually write it and push a PR. Um, and definitely uh, your contribution is welcome. Got it. Yeah. Um, one last question, any quick compare and contrast between using Rego, Gatekeeper of Power, or Kyverno or some other um, available ones? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've got 
some recommendations on that, I suppose. Uh, we're out of time, but uh, perhaps you could come back to the open kiosk and we could talk about it tomorrow. I think it's open from 10 or 10.30 until 2. Um, I'll be there. And we Thank can you. also ch chat quickly here as well. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. We'll, we'll stand around outside the room uh, and answer any questions folk have got. Yeah. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you.